channel, we have been focusing a lot on weed addiction. And that is my primary reason for being here is my recovery from cannabis addiction. So I thought it would be helpful to continue that conversation. A lot of people get really confused about weed addiction and it's a hard thing to understand because it doesn't bring us to our knees like other drugs do or doesn't do it in the same way. So it's harder to face reality. Now, if you haven't watched my other videos on that, I suggest you do that. Today, I'm just going to read through the Marijuana Anonymous book, and we're going to pull some insights from it and talk about it. So step one, and this comes from the wisdom of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay? Step one is we admitted we were powerless over marijuana, that our lives had become unmanageable. So powerless does not mean you don't have power as a human being. Powerless means you cannot control your using, right? You say you're not going to get high today. By 5 p.m., you're getting high. You say you're going to do something to contribute to your education or your work or your relationships, but you just end up getting high. That's what is meant by powerlessness. People fight this idea so much because they think it means the death of their ego or something like that. They think it means that they're not capable of doing anything. And that's not what it means. That's just more ego talking. So let's read for a minute here. Step one is about honesty, about giving up our delusions and coming to grips with reality. We had to look honestly at our relationship with marijuana and its effects on our lives. For some of us, Step one meant honesty for the very first time in our lives. So for me, I started getting high at 12 years old, and I basically was high 24 hours a day for the next 17, 18 years. I lied to myself over and over and over and over and over. And for me, shattering that lying pattern or coming to grips with the fact that I was delusional and that I needed to be honest was a very difficult thing to do. And so that's what we need to learn to do. For some of us, step one meant honesty for the very first time in our lives. I knew I was an addict. I knew I had problems, but I couldn't surrender to this idea and let go. And so that's a big part of what we're trying to do here. Many of us spent years trying to control our use of marijuana. We justified our using and rationalized that we could control it. We may have vowed to use only on weekends or to have only one joint a day. Does that sound familiar to you? Some of us promised ourselves not to smoke until after school or work or only when we were alone. Sometimes we tried using only other people's dope, not buying it for ourselves. We played games with our stash, gave our supply to friends, hid it in nooks and crannies that were hard to reach, or buried it away from home. All these efforts failed us. We learned that we could not control our using. Eventually, we returned to smoking just as much and just as often as ever, if not more. Some of us stopped for a while. Sorry, some of us stopped using for a while, but we always started again. Does that sound like yourself if you're reading this or if you're listening to this? Do you relate to these words? If you do, chances are you are in the grips of addiction. Can you just admit that to yourself? Can you let go of this illusion that you're going to be able to stop somehow on your own? If you cannot let go of that illusion, chances are you will not be able to stop. Part of step one, the principle behind step one is honesty. Okay, so can I be honest that I'm an addict? and I cannot control my using, and I cannot do it by myself, and that I need help. If you can do that, you have a chance. You have to admit to yourself and surrender to this idea that you can do this on your own, and that perhaps you're not an addict. So that is my suggestion to you, is to just let go of this illusion that you can control it, surrender to the fact that you need help, and if you can do that, you have a chance. We were living the illusion of control, thinking we could control not only our using, but also other people, places, and things. 
we spent a great deal of energy blaming others for our problems. One of the biggest indications of, of addicts, okay, and of really unhealthy behavior is that you blame everybody else for your problems. So we need to stop doing that. And if you can recognize that that's what you're doing, that's great. You, you're on the right path. Okay. We held on to the fallacy of control. Most of us had long insisted that marijuana was not even addictive. After all, it was just a natural herb which grew in many of our gardens. Our lives may have been a little frazzled, a bit out of kilter, but were they really unmanageable? Many of us didn't lose our jobs. Our families hadn't deserted us. Our lives didn't seem to be total disasters. We were living the fantasy of functionality. That part there is so important because so many people that are addicted to weed just continue lying to themselves and bullshitting themselves because they say they're not as bad as other addicts. Oh, I still have a job. I can still go to work. I'm not a homeless person on the street, right? These are all the lies and the delusional things we say to ourselves to allow us to keep using. And this, we were living the fantasy of functionality is amazing. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Some of us had hoped that people in recovery could teach us to control our using so we could enjoy, enjoy it again. But we found otherwise. Some of us hung on to the delusion that someday we could use marijuana in a moderate and controlled way. A lot of people want to somehow figure out so a lot of people want to figure out how they can keep using or just not as much. There's a great book out recently called Dopamine Nation by Dr. Anna Lemke. And she outlines very clearly the neuroscience <clears throat> of addiction. And in order to recover, right, or to understand whether or not you can control your using, you need an extended period of abstinence. And then you can experiment with trying to use in a controlled way. Now, most people, if you're watching this video and you're relating to some of these things, chances are uh, moderate use is not an option for you. But for those people who aren't sure, you need to stay sober for a month or so. That's what the neuroscience says. Two weeks at least, but a month is best. Then if you want to try using in a controlled way after that, go ahead and try. See if that works for you. If not, I'll see you back on this channel in these videos. Okay, to read on. We were caught by the disease of addiction, ensnared in the insidious grip of marijuana. It was a best friend for years, and then it turned on us. Gone were the days when marijuana lifted our spirits. Now it left us filled with grief. Gone were the days of insight. Now we experienced confusion, paranoia, and fear. No longer did marijuana expand our social consciousness. Some of us became delusional, living in our own private worlds. No longer did using pave the way to friendship. Many of us became withdrawn and isolated. I'm just going to pause. I relate to so much of this, but that last one in particular for me, when I was a teenager and even a young adult, getting high with people was my way of socializing. So I had lots of friends. I had places to go, things to do. But that's always because I said, hey, let's get high. And if people didn't want to get high, then I would probably not hang out with them. And if you can notice how that looks for you, I think I have a video on are your friends determined by your marijuana use? That's a big one, right? We 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 manipulate our world to allow us to keep getting high and to pretend that things aren't a problem. Okay, we were too frightened, detached, and lethargic to reach out for friendship, intimacy, or love. Our need to get and stay high determined how we spent our time and with whom. Our emotional lives have become flat or frantic. We were uncomfortable with our emotions and sometimes frightened by them or frightened of them, excuse me. We realized we were beaten many times, but couldn't stop. Sooner or later, the spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical disease overcame us. 
bringing us to the depths of despair and hopelessness. In Marijuana Anonymous, we discovered the reality of powerlessness. Surrender outweighs the illusion of control and becomes our only option for recovery. Surrender. This idea of surrender is a spiritual idea, you could say, or a wisdom idea that is shared across cultures, across religions, across spiritual practices. Really what this means is surrendering to our ego, surrendering to this part of our brain that thinks it can control things. And when you can just let go of that, there's tremendous relief and freedom. And really the only way you can get relief and have a sense of freedom and serenity is to surrender here. We were powerless over marijuana in all its forms. Okay. Until we admitted our powerlessness, denial kept us from realizing how unmanageable our lives had become. Going to read a, a little acronym here for denial. Don't even notice I am lying. It's a great one. Okay. So our our, our visions of achievement and our desires of being wise, loving, compassionate, or valued had remained mostly dreams. When I got high all the time, I would say, oh, I'll just go back to university later. I'll go get a job another day. Oh, all this pain and shame and fear and guilt that I'm stuffing or numbing with getting high all the time, I'll deal with that another day. But of course, you know that day never, ever comes. It only comes the day you surrender and admit to yourself you're an addict and that you can't live like this anymore. Then you have a chance for freedom. There's a great saying in recovery, um, sobriety brings all the things that drugs and alcohol promised. It's a wonderful saying. So I'll keep reading here. So we rarely realized our potentials. We had settled for being merely functional. Some of us went even further. We began to lose our mental faculties. We could not work. Our families abandoned us. Some of us were in danger of being committed to jails or mental institutions. More and more, we associated with dangerous people to ensure our marijuana supply. Some of us, some of us became victims of abuse. Some of us became abusers. A few of us were derelicts. In spite of all this, we still had difficulty admitting that we could no longer manage our own lives. Powerless, we thought we were the center of the universe. And that's the ego. Another lovely saying is, addicts are egomaniacs with an inferiority complex. It's a big one. Okay, so we had tried everything over the years to change reality to no avail. In MA, we at last found the courage to face the truth. We stopped practicing denial and became willing to face our disease. Having come to this moment of clarity, we could not afford any reservations about being powerless over our disease. The entire foundation of our program depends on an honest admission of our powerlessness over addiction and the unmanageability of our lives. We are, however, responsible for our own recovery. This goes back to the idea of stop blaming other people for your problems. Stop blaming your boss, your parents, the government, your wife, your daughter, your husband, your friends. This is on you. This is on you. Nobody else. Step one was the first step to freedom. We admitted our lack of power and our inability to control our lives. We began to acknowledge how mentally, emotionally, and spiritually bankrupt we had become. We became honest with ourselves. It was only by admitting our powerlessness in this first step that we became willing to take the next 11 steps. Recovery does not happen all at once. It is a process, not an event. The process is set in motion the day we quit using or begin attending meetings. It begins with a real desire to stop using, with a genuine change in our attitude, with a soul-transforming realization that we are finally willing to go to any lengths to change our lives. I don't know about you, but I would have walked in 500 miles in a snowstorm to get high if I had to. 
So the least I can do is work on my recovery. When we admitted that we were marijuana addicts, that we were really powerless over marijuana, and that our lives had truly become unmanageable, then we began to realize how futile it was to keep trying to manage the unmanageable. We began to give up our arrogance and defiance. Our complete surrender and new way of life were essential to our recovery. In order to have any hope of rebuilding our lives, we simply had to find a source of power greater than ourselves and greater than our addiction. For that, we turned to step two. All right, everybody, we will be back with step two. I hope you found this useful. Again, please subscribe, comment, like this video, share it with someone who you think might be struggling with addiction or marijuana addiction. And I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Peace out.